Good morning. And welcome to God's house on this beautiful August morning. Thank you, Nancy, for that beautiful prelude. Uh, announcements for today. Uh, they want all families to receive, all families will receive a free 8x10 professional portrait along with a printed directory. Our photo sessions will be held September 23rd, 24th, and 25th from 2 to 9 p.m. and sem September the 26th from 10 to 5 p.m. Uh, the Candy King Craft Show will be Saturday, November the 14th at 9 a.m. until 2. The spaces are $15. The deadline to reserve a space is August the 31st. To reserve a, a space, please call Bonnie Boniger at 717-659-1403. And she says there are only three spaces left. There's none left. <laughs> oh, I'm just correct you right now. They're, they're all sold. We're good to go for this fall. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, they want to thank everyone who bought and sold sandwiches for our summer fundraiser. Uh, we greatly appreciate your support. We made a profit of $597.22. In splitting this in half, we were able to donate $298.68 to the Back to School Fund Day. Our next fundraiser begins August the 19th, Kids Stuff Coupon Books. $25 each, and this is the daycare. Uh, Pastor Mitch would uh, like to hold confirmation classes on Sunday evenings from October to February. If your child is 13 years of age or in seventh grade, uh, you need to let him know if you're interested. There are also Jerry and Giant gift cards available. Uh, Shining Light Ministries is planning another family picnic on Saturday, August the 29th at Muddy Run. Uh, it's at the campground, and it's from 2, 2 o'clock on. E evening meal is to begin at 5. Meat and drinks will be provided, and we would just ask each family to bring a covered dish to share with all. There will be a fried chicken dinner on August the 22nd from 4 to 7, and this event is for Diane Leon to take part in a medical slash dental outreach ministry for, e for Ethiopia in November of 2015. There are also classes being held this fall for lay speaker recertification of lay speaker and equipping God's people. Uh, the events for this week are Monday, August the 17th, Shining Light at 6 and Boy Scouts at 6.30. Tuesday, August the 18th, is Ladies' Bible Study at 9 and Shining Light at 6. Wednesday, August the 19th, Shining Light at 6. Thursday, August the 20th, Spirit of Praise at 7. And Saturday, August the 22nd, is the Chicken Dinner from 4 to 7. Do you have an announcement? No? Okay. Uh, the birthdays for this week are Monday, Robert Leon. Tuesday, Elaine McGinnis and Alexandria Wetzel and Saturday, Jerry Seitz and Kaylee Kobe. Anniversaries this week are Thursday, Carla and Larry Owens. And now we will have a time of fellowship.
Would you please stand for the call to worship? Let every worshiper of Christ enter this day for worship. But the saving power of the Lord is beyond all we might imagine. Then let our hearts be joined in praise for God's redeeming love. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And now we uh, turn your hymnals to page 370 and we will sing Victory in Jesus. <laughs>
you may be seated. And now we'll have our prayers and concerns. Yesterday, as all of you know, we had our uh, fourth back to school day. And um, every year we do a prayer, uh, we have a prayer tent and we actually have some prayer concerns that we want to bring to the Lord today. We also have um, a number of kids that we had here yesterday actually totaled 244 children that were registered, and yet there were more, more kids here than that because some kids choose not to take any of the supplies or they were beyond the ages of elementary, and so it was a, it was a great and wonderful day that the Lord blessed us with. A little hot, um, but uh, I think everybody had smiles on their face and the word of God was shared with each other. It's amazing when you take the opportunity to sit and listen to people to how the problems that we think we have don't compare to what some of the things that the other folks do. And um, I want to thank everybody who, who helped in one way or another. It's, a, it's one of those wonderful ministries that there's no age restriction. Young or old, they, everybody can participate. Uh, and, and we had that that, that. that was demonstrated clearly yesterday. In fact, that comment was made to me by the principal over here at the elementary school. So um, what we want to do is we want to bring to the Lord in prayer today all these kids. One, that was one day's event, but there's 365 days in a year until we see them again. We need to keep them in our prayers. We need to think about those ministries that we can do to reach out to them and open up our hearts that when that time comes, we're going to be, we're going to be receptive to it and we're going to reach out to those kids in need. The prayer concerns I have the first one that came to us was Lord hear my prayer for my friends, my family, and I, so that we can get our finances in order. Also have another one here that says, Lord, hear my prayer. I am a single mom working two jobs. I'm struggling to pay bills, but I'm trying to get my continuing education, education classes completed. Please pray for me and my girls so we have enough to eat every day. Please pray that I stay strong and don't give up, even though that's crossed my mind far too many times in this recent future. I just want to be there for my girls, Belinda, Skylar, and Emma. There's many more that we probably have touched through, through the day. I had, um, we had another woman who came and uh, she just cried and hugged Beth, Kobe, um, said, you don't know what a blessing this is because I couldn't make it on my own. So I, I just thank you. Thank you for your time, for your donations. And also, um, as we go th from here, we actually collected money yes yesterday. Those people, there was people that just wanted to give back to the church. And we told them this was a totally free event for those folks because we knew they were in need. But we, if they wanted to give money, they could give money to Diane Leon for her mission trip to Ethiopia. So we collected money for her for that. The church got nothing back from there, but we're going to help reach out into this world through, through Diane. So thank you. And also, um, besides those gifts, those backpacks we gave away, we also made another 244 bags that went to Mission Central. So that will go to kids across the country and across the world. So just imagine the impact that you, as a congregation of Winterstown, made to this community and now reaching far parts of the world. And now we'll take prayers and concerns as you normally do.
Good morning. It is now your turn to share your joys and concerns as the people of God. And if you have concerns or joys, just raise your hand and they'll bring the microphone around to you. What's the name again? Jean. Okay. Okay, Jean. And it's good to see you, Pastor Mitch. You came through your surgery and you're here today. That's a wonderful blessing. Thank you. <laughs> and I thank you for all of your prayers and your cards and your words of encouragement for those of you who have gone through this. I understand you, uh, <laughs> that there have been quite a few, so I've joined a new club. Uh, <laughs> uh, just to ask for prayer for the people involved in the accident out in front of the church yesterday. And this is, this is not a prayer concern or a joy. This is an announcement that was forgotten to be made. Um, Next week, the ushers are going to observe what we call our annual Hawaiian Sunday. And we're going to encourage anybody in the church that has a Hawaiian shirt to wear it next Sunday. Daddy home. I went to rest home. It's anything but rest. I had two, two deaths this morning. One person fell and broke an arm and a hip. They won't let me get in and out and get close to anything. And I just, wonderful place to be. Mm. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Mm. I'd like to thank God for sending one of my son's Marine Corps buddies here to uh, spend three days with me. It was three very enjoyable days, and those men have kept in touch with me for 45 years, and it's been very consoling to me. Thank you, Mary. Now let us pray. God, you are awesome, beautiful, wonderful, gracious, and generous. We give you thanks for the opportunity to come into the sanctuary this morning to lift up our voices in praise once again to you. We give you thanks for the week that you have given us, and we look forward to the days that are before us. I thank you this morning again for our activity yesterday, our back-to-school fun day, we thank you for all those persons who helped and for Jay's leadership. We thank you for the children here at the Hope Sc Hopewell School and also the children around the world who are going to be getting these book bags filled with school supplies. They seem so simple to some of us, but for some, they are so important. I thank you this morning for the ministries that you have given to us here in this place and at this time and for the resources and the leadership that continues to make these ministries possible. You have heard our prayer concerns for members and friends of the congregation who need your strength, a strength that goes beyond our own abilities. And so I would ask that you would hear those prayers and give us wisdom and discernment to be able to see your hand at work in their lives. We do pray that you would be with Jean, and we pray that you would be with the family that was in the accident yesterday and keep them safe and make them well again. And we also pray today for those persons who we do not know, but who need your healing touch. And our hearts always go out in sincere prayer for those who have not yet known Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I pray that today may be the day that they accept him into their hearts and into their lives. 
Father, hear our prayers as we bring them to you today in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Maybe after a year I'll get used to saying sins instead of trespasses. Okay. At this time, it is our joy to be able to return to God a different way of saying thanks as we bring before him today our tithes and offerings. And know that by giving these tithes, you're not just helping to pay the bill, but you're following the commandment of God and you're growing in your discipleship as you give your uh, blessings that God has given you as you return those blessings to him. of your love Lord and now we return these gifts to you as our way of thanking you and we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you will multiply these gifts that they may indeed go into all the world we ask in the name of Jesus our Lord and Savior Amen now we'll join in singing hymn number 171 there's something about that name <laughs>
may be seated. And now Nancy Farre will introduce our special music for this morning. Okay, we have two special young girls that are going to play some piano duets together. They are sisters. Uh, Milena Valovich is 12 years old. She's going to be a seventh grader at Redline Junior High School. And Veronica is seven years old. She's going to the second grade at Locust Grove Elementary School in the Redline School District. And her family is also here. I would like them to stand. Uh, father, Vitaly Falovich. Mother, Sandra Falovich. And Simon, who is five years old, Simon Falovich. Okay? And he likes to play the drums. <laughs> How many people have played the piano? Raise your hand. Ooh, we got lots of piano players over the years. How many people play chopsticks? Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to have a special arrangement of chopsticks. And Veronica, who's the youngest that's sitting on the far right of the piano, she's going to do something special. It's called a glissando. And if you've ever had taken piano lessons, you know what a glissando is. And we take and go up the keys. So today, during the chopsticks, you will get to hear glissandos from Veronica. So we will start with chopsticks. song that they're going to play is Jesu Joy A Man's Desiring. This one's a little bit slower and more churchy, but we thought we'd do a pizzazzy song by using chopsticks just for the fun of it. So now we'll hear Jesu Joy A Man's Desiring. <laughs>
to uh, conserve Mitch's energy and his throat. As you know, when you go into surgery, they put the tube down your throat and that has an effect on it. So um, I'll be reading from John 9, 1 through 12. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Join with me in prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me and mold me, fill me and use me, for I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Have you ever picked up a Bible that wasn't yours, or maybe even picked up your own Bible and discovered that there are certain pages that seem to be tattered and torn, or bent back, or the corners seem to be rarely floppy? Well, that's the case with my Bible. And the verses that Carol read to you is, are the verses that usually I turn to that people would be able to see like you can on this book, but these pages have been looked at many times. This ninth chapter of John's Gospel has uh, given me many, many insights. And this morning I want to share just one of those with you. The story, <laughs> I used this story a number of years ago when I was uh, teaching the advanced preaching course for lay speakers. And uh, we began talking a little bit about what does it mean to when we suffer? And why do we suffer? And what can the church do in order to uh, <coughs> minister to those who are suffering? Well, I believe that the passage that Carol read to you today and another vo verse will help us answer those questions. First thing uh, I want to tell you is that uh, last year I had the opportunity to teach these 12 verses at Mission U. Formerly it was the uh, United Methodist Women's School of Mission. And uh, it took me eight hours to teach them. So sit back and get comfortable. Okay. <laughs> I won't do that to you today. I don't think my voice will hold up that long. But I do want to address one of the aspects. I think that in this uh, particular passage of Scripture, we see that when it comes to dealing with persons with disabilities or persons who are going through trials and tribulations, that the first thing that Jesus did was to get the thinking straight. Without that, the following three things wouldn't make much sense. Then Jesus got involved in the life of the man. When he took the clay and he touched the man's eyes... And then he said to the man, go to the pool of Siloam, which to me represents God seeing that this man had ability, even with mud in his eyes, even when he couldn't see. He had abilities to be the child of God. 
And so he sent him forth. And as far as I know, this is the only time in the Gospels that uh, God or Jesus tells someone that they have to go and do something before they are healed. And then if we flip over into the 31st verse of this chapter, we discover that the uh, religious leaders of the day didn't like what they were hearing from this man. And so they threw him out of the synagogue. But somehow Jesus got word that they had done this, and he went after the man, and when he found him, he said to him, the most important question that you and I can answer in our lives, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man said, who is he, sir, that I might believe? And Jesus said, you're looking at him. And the man said, yes, I believe. Get your thinking straight. Get involved in the life of the people. Send them forth with the abilities that they have. Recognize the abilities that they have. But don't stop there. Because a social worker can do that. But only those who are disciples of Jesus Christ can ask that question. Do you believe in the Son of God? Well, I want to talk about the first aspect today, getting your thinking straight. Because as I said, without that, the rest of it just won't make any sense. Jesus was walking with his disciples, as Carol shared with you this morning, and they saw this man who was blind. They must have known him before, or they heard about him because they knew he was blind from his birth. And so they turn to Jesus and say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, you can't be too hard on the, on the disciples at this point. You've got to remember, they were Jews. And from the time they were very small and all the time they were growing up, they heard it taught in the synagogue that if you had a disability, if you had an illness, if you had a disease, if you were suffering, it was because something you did. God was punishing you. For them, it was kind of like a cliché. A couple years ago when I was teaching this, uh, the advanced course in preaching, we talked about these verses. And people were giving answers to the question of why they're suffering. And finally, one of the ladies, I think it was Pat, said, those are PCAs. And I said, they're what? She said, they're PCAs. And I said, what's a PCA? And she said, it's a Pat Christian answer. It makes you feel good, but does it really help the other person? It's a pat Christian answer. So today I want to address to you, with you five of those PCAs that I've bumped into in my life for 50 years living as a person with a disability. And uh, you may find yourself saying, oh, I say that sometimes. And if so, join the club because we've all said these things from time to time. But I hope that after today, they'll make you think a little bit more about what you do say and a better understanding about this topic of suffering in the world. Well, the first thing, PCA, that I want to share with you kind of goes back to what the disciples were asking Jesus because they thought that this man had done something wrong. Even his parents had done something wrong. They thought some of them even believed that what he did wrong happened before he was even born. And now he's being punished. That was their thought. Now, we don't go around today, at least I hope that uh, we don't. But I can tell you that back in 19, well, 1980, around that time, when we returned from seminary to Chambersburg to our first charge, I had the opportunity to... Uh, be interviewed by a reporter from the Waynesboro paper. And uh, I don't know how we got into this topic, but I shared with her some of my experiences and some of my beliefs about, uh, about suffering and about God's role in that. And uh, as I talked, she started to cry, and I never made a reporter cry before. And she said, I wish my uncle could hear what you're saying. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, because my aunt has cancer. And all my uncle will say to her is, if you'll just confess your sin, God will take your cancer away. Have you heard that before? And we're a little bit more sophisticated today, I believe, in how we ask that question. We don't come right out and say, why is God punishing or God is punishing me? 
But I can tell you that many times when people find themselves dealing with suffering or disabilities or whatever, that the first thing they ask is, why is God doing this to me? What did I do to deserve this? Are we not like the disciples asking that same question? Why is God punishing me? So the first thing that I think is a, a PCA is to get clear in our minds that our God does not punish us with disabilities, with suffering. 29th chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah says to a people of his day who were suffering, by the way, and wondering where God was in all this, God gives Jeremiah a word to share with the people. He said, I do not willingly afflict my children, but I have a plan for you. It is a plan that you should prosper and not be harmed, that you should have future and a hope. Look it up in Jeremiah chapter 29. It's right there. Now, does that sound like a God who is punishing us? How many of us would be able to come to church today and worship a God who would punish a child with leukemia? I couldn't. But I know that what that God wants for that child is future and a hope. So, there's the first PCA that we need to deal with today. The second one you may have heard someone say, I've heard it said a couple times, there but for the grace of God go I. Think about what you're saying. There but for the grace of God go I. Do you have more grace than I do? Carol and I, when we were in seminary, went to the Dayton Arena to hear a Christian seminar, and the uh, speaker came on the big screen TV, and for two or three nights, we sat there and we listened to him give his thoughts about uh, religion and faith. And part of the discussion was about people who are suffering. And in that discussion, he said that people who suffer have more grace than anyone else. Well, I'm not the kind of person that likes to rock the boat, but well, Carol will from time to time. And she saw that I was starting to burn a little bit. And uh, she went out during the intermission and said to one of the people who was leading the course, my husband wants to talk to you after the program. And I talked to them and I, and I said, you know, I don't believe that I have any more grace than anyone else has. Jesus did not come into the world and say, okay, I'll give you this much grace and you this much grace and you this much grace. When he died on the cross, he gave it all to each and every one who would believe. He did not proportion it. So I do not believe that I have more grace than you. What that leader of that seminar said caused one person, as we were leaving the arena that night, to say to a friend, do you want to meet a man that's worth a million dollars? And I thought, oh boy, being in seminary, our debts were rising, and I thought, I sure would. I hope he would give me some. And when we got in the car, Carol said, you know who that man was pointing to? And I said, no, I don't. And she said, to you because he had just heard that I had more grace than anyone else but it's not so God's grace is given freely to each and every one of us freely given to us and the so that's the second PCA and the third one is kind of close to it when people will kind of comfort themselves and think they're comforting others when they, they say, well, if you just had a little bit more faith, God would take that away from you. Believe it or not, I have heard that a number of times in 50-some years. If you just had a little bit more faith. When I was in college, one of our professors wanted to take me and Two of my friends who were visually impaired, they, could, they had some sight, but they were still legally blind, out to Pittsburgh to see Catherine Coleman. Now, that name may be familiar to some of you. Uh, back in the 60s and the 70s, Catherine Coleman was known as a great faith healer. And uh, she held uh, healing sessions out in a large church out in Pittsburgh. So one spring day, our professor got my friends and I together, and he took us out to see Catherine Coleman. And I can tell you, I saw many, many miraculous things happen that day. 
But I also saw a lot of people walk out the same way they walked in, with the same disabilities. When I got back to the campus, I had belonged to a Christian group on campus, and uh, they were praying for my friends Jeff and Phil and I that, that when we were out there that indeed something would happen. But nothing happened to Phil, nothing happened to Jeff, and I came back just as blind as I was when I went there. But their response to me was, well, if you'd have just had a little bit more faith, God would have, you know, God would have been able to heal you. Do you know what you're saying when you say that? That you have more faith than I do because you can see, you can hear, you can use your hands, you can walk. You don't have the problems that people who are suffering have. Therefore, you have more faith. Well, just as I believe God's grace is poured out to all of us, I do also believe that we all have faith. And yes, there were times in the Gospels that God or Jesus did say to the people, your faith has made you well. But there were other times when the only thing that cured the people from whatever their suffering was, was the grace of God, given freely and totally to them. That's the third PCA today. The next one, again, I have heard many times. This is God's will for your life. Have you ever heard anyone say that when you've been suffering? This is God's will for your life. Well, I want you to show me in the scriptures where it says that God's will is that anyone should be afflicted with suffering or disabilities. Did he not say my plan for you is to prosper and not for harm for f a future and for hope God's will is not to come and to zap people with different disabilities or different situations in which they are suffering but I'll show you what I think God's will is and it goes all the way from the beginning of our scriptures all the way through the book of Revelation and it begins with Genesis. In the uh, 17th chapter of Genesis, we read that God says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout all of their generations. It shall be an everlasting covenant between God and you. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And then we turn to the book of Exodus. You find the same thing repeated there. I will be your God, you shall be my people. It's said a number of times in Exodus. It's found in Leviticus, it's found in Deuteronomy, and it's found a number of times in the prophet Jeremiah. In the seventh chapter of the prophet Jeremiah, we read these words. Now remember, the people were suffering. But God speaks through the prophet and says, But this command I gave them, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And you shall walk in all of the way that I command you, and it may be well with you. Flip over to the 24th chapter, the same book, and you read these words. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord and that they shall be my people and I will be their God. For they shall have a heart, or excuse me, they shall return to me with their whole hearts. I don't know who took the time to count all the times it says in the Old Testament, I will be your God and you shall be my people. But the answer that I found was that it's stated there 28 times. That's the will of God. It's been God's will from the time of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. We turn into the New Testament, go to John 3, 16. What's God's will? Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Go to John 6 that we looked at last week. Remember we were by the Sea of Galilee and the people were coming to Jesus and they said to him, well, what must we do to be doing the work of God? And Jesus' answer to them was very simple. Believe in me, this is the work of God. That was his answer. Later on, I think that he would uh, make it a little bit clearer when he said to that rich man, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Does that sound like a God who would punish us? Does that sound like a God who would give some grace and others not? Some faith and others not? Whose will would be that certain people should suffer and others would not? I don't think so. Think again, or remember again, from the book of Revelation. Very last book, 21st chapter. Again it says, I heard a voice, a loud voice from the throne say, Behold, the dwelling of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and he shall be their God. What's the will of God? That he should be our God, and we should be his people that we have a future and a hope. That's what I believe is the will of God. Okay, that's number four. Number five is one that, again, I'm sure you may have said or you may have heard said to you, this is the cross God gave you to bear. People, when they're trying uh, over the years to understand my blindness or to comfort me, have said from time to time, well, you know, this is just a cross God gave you to bear. Well, you know what? I don't believe that our arthritis or our rheumatism or our bunions or our blindness or our deafness or our lameness or whatever it might be is the cross that God gave us to bear. That's not the cross that Jesus bore. The cross that Jesus picked up was a cross of suffering it was a cross of giving himself totally to others that's the cross that you and I are commanded to pick up not simply to live with our disabilities and be happy about it but rather to follow in the way of Christ to pick up that cross of love and compassion and hope and forgiveness and peace and joy to pick up that that cross of reconciliation. That's the cross that God tells us to pick up and to carry. Okay, those are the five pat Christian answers as I've experienced them in my 50 years of living with a disability. So what's my answer? What is my answer to the suffering then? Well, Jesus answers that question first of all today in our scripture lesson when uh, he turns to the disciples and I, I have to think he was feeling a bit sorry for them and thinking, ah, oh, this is another opportunity to teach them something new. You know, Jesus was always teaching people something new and he still is to change their lives, to change their thinking. And he looked at them and he said, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. But I like the way that uh, William Barclay in his daily study uh, commentary puts it. He said, it was not that this man sinned, neither did his parents sin, but it happens that in him the works of God might be demonstrated. And I believe that that's God's plan and purpose for each and every one of us, that we demonstrate the works of God. Some of your translations will say, that the glory of God may be made manifest. Jesus didn't look at the man's disability. He looked at the man. We do not honor God with our sufferings or our disabilities. We honor God with the life we live. And so I believe that Jesus begins to answer that question for me. But then I also had an experience that helped me to define a little bit better my understanding of suffering. When our daughter was just learning how to walk, she liked to go see cows. We lived in Chambersburg, we lived in the country, and behind our parsonage was a farm, Farmer Charlie's farm. And Farmer Charlie had geese and ducks and guineas and cows. And my daughter just loved to go see the cows. 
So we would take her down, walk her to see the cows. One Sunday afternoon after she woke up from her nap, she said, go see cows. So we got her dressed and we took her to see the cows. Now, in order to see the cows, you had to go down a rather steep hill. Kim had a hold of my finger. She had a hold of Carol's finger. Now, remember, she was just learning how to walk. We were going downhill. Her little feet got traveling faster than the rest of her body could go, and all of a sudden, she left go of our fingers, and she fell on the street. And you know what happens when little girls fall on the street? They cut themselves. And that's what happened to our daughter. And we picked our daughter up, and we hugged her, and we took her back to the parsonage, and Carol cleaned the wound on her chin, and she put a Snoopy Band-Aid on it, and Kim sat up and said, Go see cows. I believe that our God is not a God who punishes us. Our God is not a God who dispenses grace in proportion. Our God is not a God who gives some faith and some not faith. Our God is not a God who wills that we suffer. And our God is not a God who believes that our cross to bear is our disabilities. I believe that our God is a God who picks us up in the midst of our sufferings and gives us the strength to carry on. I believe that our God is a God who enables us to use the powers that we have, the strength that we have, the miracles of technology that we have in order to get ourselves back on our feet that we might demonstrate the works of God, not through our suffering, but rather through the life that we live. Seems like a rather simple way to understand suffering, doesn't it? But it's what I've lived by for the past 50 years, that my God is a loving God. My God is a God who picks me up when I'm down and lets me say, let's go again. I hope that today that you'll think about these pat Christian answers, and if you've given them, you know, okay, you're part of the club, we've all done it. But if you say them again, think about what you're saying and think, am I saying this to help myself or am I saying it to help my friend who's suffering? I believe that today Jesus is changing our mind and telling us that if we want to be a church that reaches out to people with disabilities, we've got to get our thinking straight. Only then can we come, become involved in their lives only then can we see the gifts that God has given them and empower them to use those gifts. And then we can continue to seek them to make sure that they receive the greatest gift of all, the salvation of our lives. Join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, I give you thanks and praise for these words today. And I pray that as we leave here today that we may examine in our own minds the things we say when it comes to dealing with suffering. I give you thanks and praise that you are a God who reaches out to your people, who says to us, I want prosperity for you and not harm. I want a future for you and a hope for you. My will for you is that I would be your God and you will be my children. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for such love. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now will you stand with me as we join in singing together. Lead on, O King Eternal. <laughs>
And now may you go out into the world to demonstrate the works of God in your life. Go in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.